Welcome to today's planning and zoning meeting. It's March 23rd, 2016. I want to make a quick announcement up front that if you're here for case 4E Z16017 District 2 at Baseline Road in West of Wrecker, that case has been continued due to um, a need to repost. It will be heard um, April 20th. And the first item that we have on our agenda is the consent agenda. Item two is approval of the minutes from our previous meetings as revised by staff and discussed earlier at our study session. It includes the February 16th and 17th study sessions, February 17th regular meeting, and March 1st study session and regular meeting. Item 3A is case Z16011 in District 6, located on the east side of Crisman Road, north of the US 60 Superstition Freeway, 0.82 acres. This is a site plan review to allow for the development of a restaurant with a drive through and the staff recommendation is approval with the conditions as modified and discussed in our earlier study session. Item 3B is case Z16014, District 6, the 4200 through 4400 block of South Signal Butte Road and the 10,300 block through 10,800 block of East Point 22 Boulevard, approximately 107 acres. This request will establish a development unit plan for development unit six south of the East Mark Community Plan. The staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Item C3 is KZ16016 in District 6, 1300 block of South Crisman Road, approximately one acre. This is a special use permit and site plan review to allow for the development of a car wash. The staff recommendation is approval with the modified conditions as discussed at our study session earlier. Item 3D is case Z15037 in District 6. The 10,800 through 10,900 blocks of East Guadalupe Road and 2,700 block of South Signal Butte Road, approximately 17.86 acres. This is a site plan modification and preliminary plat to allow for the development of a mini storage and retail center. The staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Item 4B is KZ16009, District 2, the 1000 block of North Greenfield Road. This is a rezoning from AG to RS15 PAD, a site plan review and a preliminary plat to allow a single residence development on approximately 3.59 acres. The staff recommendation is approval with the conditions as contained in the staff memo dated March 23rd, 2016. Item 4C is case Z16012 in District 4, 60 South Country Club Drive, located on the west side of Country Club, south of Main Street, approximately 0.66 acres. This is a rezoning from DB1 to GCBIZ in a site plan review to allow for the auto, an automobile vehicle sales and leasing facility and a redevelopment of the site consistent with TF, excuse me, T4NF transect. This staff recommendation is approval with conditions as revised by the staff and discussed at our earlier study session. Item 4D is case Z16015 in District 2, 6215 East Arbor Avenue, approximately 1.8 acres. This is a council use permit for a social services facility to allow for a substance abuse detoxification and treatment center. The staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Item 4E is case Z16017, District 2, 5850 East Stills Circle, approximately 11.44 acres. This is a PAD modification and site plan review. The staff recommendation is to continue this item to the April 20th, 2016 meeting in order to repost the public hearing sign. Item 5A is the Estates of Valencia South, preliminary plat, District 2, the 1000 block of North Greenfield Road. This companion case is Z16009 and the staff recommendation is approval with the conditions as contained in the staff memo dated March 23rd, 2016. Item 5B is the preliminary plat for Eastmark DU 8 and 9 revised, District 6, 10,200 block through 10,800 blocks of East Ray on 6.7 acres approximately. The staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Item 5C is the East Mark DU6 South parcels one and two, 4200 through 4400 block of South Signal Butte Road. 
This companion is case is Z16014 and the staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Item 5D is the preliminary plat for Eastmark DU6 South Parcels 6-7 and 6-8 District 6, 10,300 through 10,400 block of East Point 22 Boulevard. The companion case is Z16014. The staff recommendation is approval with conditions. And item 5E is the Mesa Center Point preliminary plat, District 6. Its companion case is Z15037, and the staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I would make a motion. I would make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as read in for the record. Is there a second? I'll second. Please vote. Consent agenda passes unanimously. The next item, actually it's the only item left on the agenda that was not on consent, is 4A. This is Z16004 in District 6, 8200 to 8600 blocks of East Baseline Road, north side, located west of the 202 on the north side of Baseline Road, approximately 52.4 acres, PAD modification for the 52.4 acres and site plan review for 16 plus acres. This request will allow for a multi-residence development um, and first I'd like to hear a overview from staff, then we have the applicant, and then we have one person that requested to speak. Chairman, member of the board, uh, as you mentioned, this is a zoning case Z16004. It is a request to allow a development of a multi-residence project. Uh, it is part of a 52-acre uh, PAD modification. So r the development area is only 16 acres. It's at the corner of Hawes and uh, uh, Baseline and 202. So this is a proposal to build a multifamily of 325 units. As I mentioned, it's in 16 acres, so the density roughly comes to 20 uh, dwelling units per acre. It's all within the zoning uh, district RM4, and it's also the general plan is baseline mixed use. Oh, sorry, it's approved as the baseline mixed use uh, development. Uh, the z general plan is a high density residential 15 plus. And, and part of these 325 units, uh, we have 16 buildings here, uh, as you see in, there are six of the buildings which are two-story, mostly garage on the bottom and units on the top. Uh, we call them the carriage units. So two of them faces uh, baseline. The other four is along the future Hawes Road alignment. And then the whole layout, the other six buildings, those are three-story building, laid out around a nice central court with the two pools and amenities. So it's very well designed in that uh, arrangement. Um, so there is roughly 131 one bedroom, 180 two bedroom and 14 three bedroom units. And of course they have a nice clubhouse with 8,000, roughly 8,000 square feet. So in my staff report, I have detailed out, I'm not going to go through all that. <clears throat> so they had PAD modification requests because uh, they had uh, certain uh, things that they could not address through the layout, uh, like our zoning ordinance asked for 60 square feet uh, per unit balcony area, whether it's upstairs or patio, but they have <clears throat> variations. They have some of the balcony or patios are large enough than what we need, but their minimum is 48 square feet, which is kind of less than <clears throat> And then there are building separations. So the two building way to the north, which are kind of in an angle, doesn't meet our standard of building separations. And then of course, <clears throat> the other one is our parking ratio. Uh, City of Mesa current zoning ordinance says parking ratio is 2.1 per unit. We don't really distinguish between bedrooms. It's just a flat number, 2.1. So the applicant uh, says like it's very difficult for them to meet that 2.1. Uh, 
So they gave the analysis, which in my staff report, and uh, they are asking for 1.8 uh, uh, parking space per unit. So we applied our previous zoning ordinance, which actually did phased out different standard for different one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. Based on that, it comes to almost 1.9 uh, space per unit parking. So that's why in our condition of approval, we are still asking for 1.9 <coughs> parking space. And then also, uh, the like condition number 6A, like the last one, the numbers might change, uh, the ones you have now. Show an emergency access drive connected to the property to the north. So some of those came from our previous case, zoning case Z1421, the PAD modification. So other than that, uh, we are recommending approval with condition, and uh, I'm sure the applicant will address those issues that I raised. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Please state your name, address, all that. I will do that. Uh, good afternoon, Susan Demet with Gamage and Burnham, here on behalf of Housing Trust Group. Um, let me, I wanna get our presentation up here. Whoops, there we go, okay. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through our full presentation this afternoon unless you feel like you need that. I was gonna jump to the two issues that Wahid addressed as far as the the um, remaining un unresolved issues between staff, to one, when, when we really have two of them, one is related to the parking uh, ratio that we've requested for the project, and the second is um, a couple minor modifications to some of the stipulations as drafted, and as you noted, one of those is regarding an emergency access requirement. So I'm going to, let's see, get us to, um, okay, so park, the parking reduction request. We have, um, as, as Wahid noted, the city of Mesa's ordinance standard is 2.1 parking spaces per unit, irrespective of if you have a one, two, or three bedroom apartment unit. Within this project, within Aviva, we have 131 one bedroom units, 181 two bedroom units, and 14 three bedroom units. So 95% of our units are either one or two bedrooms, and we have a very small percentage of three bedroom units. We. Um, Overall, with our 1.8 parking space uh, ratio, we have 583 parking spaces as a minimum that will be provided for the project for its 325 units. And this equates to, and we'll talk about this, this statistic here in a little bit, but that relates to 1.29 parking spaces per unit. And the 1.29, which I will talk about, is the city of Mesa average number of vehicles owned by rental households across the city. And so we've looked at that as sort of a baseline. And if you take that number, then we would be required to provide 420 parking spaces and that would leave an additional 165 for visitors. So there's a lot of ways you can slice and dice those numbers and that ratios. But the, at the end of the day, um, we, we just, we very strongly believe that the City of Mesa's ordinance standard, and even the 1.9, and we appreciate staff working, working with us on this, we still believe that the 1.9 parking spaces per unit is, is a very conservative ratio and will, will result in the community being overparked. Um, and the trade-off for that is, you know, you've got more asphalt that's, you know, that remains unused and will, it will eat into amenities, open space, and landscaping, or density. Um, for the project, and so we want to kind of explain to you why we think 1.8 spaces per unit is an acceptable standard and is the right size parking standard for this project. Um, as a as just a point of comparison, and I mean, we really have touched on this, and I think we're off the the fact that the city of Mesa has um, as flat ordinance standard, but just by point of comparison, if you follow the city of Mesa's strict ordinance requirements, you have to provide more parking for a one bedroom apartment unit than you do for a five bedroom home. And, and we feel that, that there's an inequity in that standard and that the, the, the city of Mesa's multifamily parking standards don't really align with actual demand as it exists today for multifamily communities. We have one of the most significant um, factors when looking at parking beyond some of the statistics I'll talk about in a minute are demographic trends. You have a significant number of 
single occupancy households, and that number is increasing throughout the United States, and it continues to do so over the last, let me find my, uh, over the last, so over the last between um, 1970, for example, in 2012, the number of one-person households in the United States has increased from 17% of all households to 27%. And in, in the last probably 16 years, you've had an increase of um, 4 million more single-occupancy single, family, single occupancy households than you did uh, in 2000. And between 1970 and 2012, Households that include married couples with children decreased from 40% of all households in the United States to 20%. So there's been a long-running trend in the United States as a whole of households becoming smaller and more and more single occupancy households. And, and that directly relates to the need for parking for those households. And another, and I guess one other factor that we could touch on with respect to demographics is that people are also changing the way they drive. Um, you know, if you look at who the rental population will be, this department project that we're proposing, Aviva, is uh, it's a it's a high end sort of luxury resort style apartment community. It's not any no, nothing really exists like this in this eastern part of Mesa, and it's really geared towards and toward to serve the employees of sort of our burgeoning employment sector in this part of the valley. That would include Apple employees. You have a new hospital coming in at Elliott and Ellsworth. You have a lot of employment-based businesses around the airport. Um, and this project is intended to provide a lifestyle choice for them that doesn't exist today. And so looking at the demographics of, you know, those types of workers and younger workers, um, you know, people don't drive their own car as much as they as they used to, and you have a lot. And if you look at uh, millennials, for as a, as a specific example, um, they much more readily will use ride sharing um, platforms. You have Uber. You do have you know it, public transit is available to this site, although it's a it's a limited amount of public transit. But we 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 feel that these trends are lasting trends, and so. It, it doesn't do any benefit for the city or for this project to provide a parking ratio that, prov that results in an excess of asphalt and unused, unused area that you could use for other amenities really within the project. So getting into the statistical analysis, and this is what we, uh, this is what we really are relying on to demonstrate to you <clears throat> that our, our proposed parking ratio of 1.8 is an acceptable and comfortable, we think very comfortable, parking standard for this project. And I'm going to cite just as, as a quick example before I talk about this, on a local level, a couple other valley cities of the larger valley, valley cities um, that we looked at as a comparison point. The city of Phoenix, for example, has a flat parking ratio of 1.5 spaces per unit for all apartment sizes. The city of Scottsdale, as another example, uses a tiered system where you have 1.3 parking spaces for one bedroom units. 1.7 parking spaces for two-bedroom units, and then I, I believe they have a little bit higher ratio for three-bedroom units. Um, under all of those uh, other local standards, you know, we would we would more than comply um, with those standards right out of the gate with our with our proposed 1.8. And then if you move and look to some of the statistical analysis that's been done, the um, if you look at Households in the city of Mesa as a whole, so this is this is owner-occupied, renter-occupied households, the number of cars per household is 1.63 per household across the board, and that's irrespective of size, shape, form. And then you move and you look more specifically at city of Mesa rental households, rental households that would be rental homes, rental townhomes, rental apartments, condominiums. The average number of vehicles owned by a rental household in Mesa is 1.29 cars per household. Um, and so, you know, that is substantially less. And that's the number that I referenced earlier when I was, you know, providing that calculation. But that's substantially less than the 2.1 in the city's ordinance, the 1.9 that the city has offered, and the one point, even that 1.8 that we've proposed. And then if you, if, you, if you scale out and look at this on a national level, the city of Mesa, um, if you look at this bar chart, really all you need to do is look to the far right, which is Mesa, Arizona. And Mesa, Arizona has one of the highest parking ratios for apartment um, complexes of, of cities in the country. This is a comparison and analysis of parking ratios for apartment uh, 
apartment developments all across the country, and the city of Mesa is on the extreme end of that scale. And on a national average, you know, apartment complexes provide 1.62 parking spaces per unit. So with all of that data now in hand, we turn to um, the difference between what the city has proposed, which is 1.9, and the 1.8 that we have requested you consider. On its surface, it, it's worth about 30 parking spaces apart. So on the surface, it doesn't seem like a lot that you know we could squeeze 30 parking spaces into the project somewhere. But we've looked at this. We have um, this, this site plan is very tightly designed um, and includes a very high level of amenities. And the only way that we can modify the parking ratio to accommodate one, the additional 30 spaces is to either lose units within the project, which at this point in the project would require a substantial redesign of some of the buildings or elimination of probably some of the carriage units that line um, Haas Road. Um, the alternative and our more likely, um, the more likely result is that we would look at where can we regain area for asphalt out of the amenities within the project. And we've looked at that. We would probably need to eliminate, um, there's a fairly sizable dog park that's included within the community. We have a playground that is attached to that within the community. And we also have a central open space and pedestrian plaza that provides connectivity to the future commercial area. And those are, those are our only opportunities to really gain additional surface area to add parking. And so we, we firmly stand behind our belief that 1.8 spaces per unit is acceptable. Um, Housing Trust Group, who is the developer of this project, they're based in Miami, Florida. They've had 40 years of experience developing only multifamily communities. That's their bread and butter. That's what they do. Um, this is their first project in Arizona but they are confident that this parking ratio will provide adequate parking um, for the needs of this project. So we are still requesting that you consider um, the 1.8 parking spaces per unit. So that's one point of discussion. The second, and I'm gonna move, I'll move back to the uh, site plan. Stipulation, um, I'm gonna, in the, the stipulation numbers have changed, but in the revised stipulations that staff provided you today, stipulation six, little i, deals with a requirement for us to provide emergency access to, I'm gonna try to, to, it's not gonna show up on the screen. So in the Northeast, if you look immediately north of the apartment community, there's a vacant parcel that's about 15 acres in size. It's an exception parcel. It's owned by um, an outside owner. We have um, an access and easement agreement with that owner, and they will ultimately share in Hawes Road once that's constructed. Um, the city, and rightfully so, has been concerned about that parcel being up in the Northwest or northeast corner of the site, and similar to you know, we have a single-family parcel in the in the northwest corner of the site that's similarly situated. But there's a need to provide emergency access to those parcels because Hawes Road is really the only way in and out. Um, staff has asked that we provide an emergency crash gate somewhere along the north part of property line of the apartment community. Um, to provide future fire department access into that vacant parcel. We, we don't believe that that's the best solution. I mean, A, because we have absolutely no idea how that piece of property is going to develop. It could be apartments, it could be single family homes, and we have no ability to logically determine where an access point should go that they would want to connect to in the future. You know, our, so our resolution to that in the alternative stipulation that we've crafted um, basically says that we think the parcel in the northeast corner should have the same secondary access solution as our parcel in the northwest corner, which is, and I'm, I'm gonna try this again, but it's just not gonna work. Um, the, if you look in the very northwest corner of our site, almost the tip of the yellow rectangle, there are um, a number of vacant lots that are adjacent to the freeway and they are directly along a public street in the Casamia subdivision, which is to our 
um, to our west. So uh, probably a year and a half to two years ago, we began discussions with the City Mesa Fire Department about an acceptable secondary access solution for our northwest parcel. And those vacant lots I'm talking about were owned by ADOT. They were remnant parcels from when the freeway was constructed. And so the um, ADOT auctioned those and sold those about a year ago. And the owner of the larger 52-acre property bought those lots directly and specifically to provide secondary access um, out to that uh, subdivision to the west. And so our, our solution for the north East parcel is the same as our solution for the net Northwest parcel. They can be provided and we can guarantee through um, the stipulation modifications for this PAD that public street access is provided through our single family development and would provide that parcel access to that secondary access point. So we've crafted an alternate stipulation, which Nick, you have copies of that. So it, it was stipulation four. The numbers have changed. But we're, we've effectively, you can delete the stipulation that staff had crafted, and we've requested to revise it to state that emergency access to the exception property in the northeast corner will be provided by a driveway and emergency access gate accessible between the single family parcel to the west and the adjacent Casamia subdivision. Such emergency access will be approved with the preliminary plat for the single family parcels, our single family parcels. So again, I go back to the solution for secondary access for our single family piece, we believe is the best single family, or is the best secondary access solution for the exception parcel on this site. Um, be, because otherwise we feel like we would be installing a driveway and a crash gate in a location that is um, somewhat arbitrary. Uh, and the other change, that, so you'll see in the stipulations that you have just been handed, the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that I'm discussing, everything else we had previously agreed to with staff. And so stipulation four is the one on, on the handout that deals with the emergency access as well as um, deleting the 1.9 parking space per unit ratio. And then we've also requested, if you look what's on the second page of that handout, a slight clarification to what is stipulation 3.3, um, which requires that we provide three points, of, three vehicular and pedestrian points of access between the larger baseline mixed use, the whole 50, our whole 52 acre development and the exception parcel in the northeast corner. We've revised that stipulation because we had some confusion during our site plan review process. Um, and staff ag ag agreed with this resolution, but to, to clarify that stipulation to state that a, a combination of at least three vehicular and pedestrian connections between the overall baseline mixed use PAD and the exception property need to be provided. Um, so, those are, so those are the modifications that we've requested. Um, emergency access, parking ratio 1.9, and then a de minimis clarification on that final stipulation. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about those requests or the project as a whole. Oh, I had one question. On the bottom of page three, four is highlighted in yellow. That, right, that's part of, um, that was part of the stipulation for uh, the emergency access. Just that item. And you, I mean, you could, you could actually leave that in, but we had addressed that in the, in the revised wording to state that the emergency access would be approved with a preliminary plat for the single family parcels. That, that part of, of stipul the, the numbering is, um, as I mentioned, the numbering is different on the handout as it is in the revised staff stipulations, but that was a, Pre, that was part of the, the stipulation. Those were all one stipulation. They were like 4A and B initially. Okay, um, board, any questions of the applicant at this time? We still have a speaker also. Okay, we'll go ahead and listen to the, the speaker that came. And then we'll give you a chance to follow up. Okay, the speaker is Beverly Salvage. 
Please state your name and your address, and you have three minutes. Um, Thank you. Beverly Salvage, 2627 South Hibiscus, Mesa, Arizona. I live in Sunland, Sunland Village East, which is a retirement village of about 2,500 homes and condos, 4,000 people. And um, this project is, is right across baseline and up between, as you know, between Hawes and 202. And uh, it's zoned for apartments. Um, their plan looks like it's been very well thought of and uh, the amenities are, are good. Um, so there were, we had a meeting, um, Susan DeMitt and Nick Sobiesk, uh, Sobroski from the Gamage in Burtonham came out and gave a presentation to our village, which is very nice of them to take their time to do this. And uh, there were uh, quite a few people at the meeting and we had a few concerns. Uh, some of them have been answered. Um, one of these uh, questions were the security, were security uh, and if there was a manager on the premises 24 hours, uh, of the price of the rentals, and uh, also if the rentals were going to be by the month or by the week or by the year or, or what. Um, all of these questions, pretty well, as I said, are, were answered. Um, rather than the 24-hour security guard, there are going to be cameras everywhere, uh, parking and, and through all of the, uh, the village. It'll be well lighted, and it, with my understanding, it's a gated community. I didn't hear that stated, but that was what was presented. Um, the rentals seem to be in line with similar apartments in Gilbert, somewhere around 1,000 to 1,200. Probably the three bedrooms would be more. Um, my, my main concerns was in the very beginning. I liked the project, but I didn't like the looks of it. I didn't think it looked neighborhood friendly. It looked more like industrial. So I guess it's probably with the modern look nowadays. <laughs> Anyway, also um, a big question uh, with the people there was when the people come out of the complex and go to the west, there'll be an easement for them to move into the traffic. But if they're going to go east where all the stores are, like grocery stores, food, restaurants, and so on, um, and also there's a park across the baseline up about four blocks. They were going to have to cross baseline. This is a multi-family unit. So there will be perhaps some children, some teenagers, and so on. So all I'm concerned of is that if they come out of there and make a UE to go east because the signal light, as I've been told, is not going to go in until the other two housing projects are built. Well, you're going to have, say, 500 more cars, not all at the same time or the same day, but still, if they go east to the stores, they're going to have to turn somewhere. And I would request seriously that the uh, that that signal light go in at Hawes after the apartments are built for the safety's sake. You know, all you need is one person, you know, killed on the road, and whether it be a child or, or who it is, um, it really wouldn't pay to wait. And I don't know, the houses probably won't be built for what, probably another two, three years later on down the road. But uh, anyway, that was, that was a big, uh, a big concern. Um, let's see. I think that, that, I think that about covered it. Right. So, any, any questions, questions from the board? No. Nope. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you. If the applicant could address some of those concerns. I am. Ha I'm happy to do that. Um, and and to, so it is stated on the record. I know it's in our um, written materials, but the, the project is it's a gated 
um, multifamily community. And as uh, Beverly did kind of go through some of the questions that came out of our meeting with Sun Van Sunland Village, I think we had approximately 100 residents that attended that meeting. Um, from a security standpoint, she's correct. There will be on-site um, security surveillance cameras throughout the property. During normal business hours, there will be an on-site um, property manager in the clubhouse facility. Um, the uh, price of the rentals that will be specifically determined when the project is, uh, you know, kind of comes to market, and we'll look at the rates at that point in time. But today, comparable apartment communities have rents of 1000 to $1,500. A month and all of our leases will be long-term leases 12 months or longer um, again this is intended for permanent residents it's not a transition facility it's not an affordable housing facility I mean this is you know this is a place for people to call home um, on the traffic standpoint we have we, we are continue so the off-site improvements we are working through that and we will continue to work that through the platting process with the city we have had a number of conversations and actually discussions are ongoing with the transportation department regarding the specific off-site improvements that will be installed with the multifamily project um, as compared to when the single family project comes in. Um, there's a stipulation in your packet that deals with this and I think it is, it has a new number, but it is I think stipulation five now um, and the last uh, point of that stipulation is that the applicant and the city will enter into a development agreement that specifically addresses infrastructure phasing and off-site improvements, and we have to do that before the multifamily project can go forward and receive its permits. Um, we, are, we are looking at there will be a number of improvements to Baseline Road, and including the widening of Baseline Road, this installation of at least a partial median, a deceleration lane in front of our project. Um, the original intent is that the traffic signal and this extension of Hawes Road that you see that curves through the center of our site, that that would all, that was all, will be installed with the two single family um, pieces in the city has, uh, transportation department has determined that, you know, our, our project is fine with a single entrance and exit point. Um, and that uh, ultimately when that Hawes Road extension is developed, we will have a second entrance and exit to the project that will have access to the signal. We are working and are in discussions with the city right now to see if we can potentially advance the timeline for putting that traffic signal in. Um, our traffic study shows that the impact of this project on levels of service and at the, in the turning movements at that intersection are not all that significant. Um, but again, that's that's kind of it's an ongoing conversation. So we will get that resolved um, as far as what we what will specifically be built with this project and what will be built with the other phases of the project. Any questions from the board? I just had a quick one with regards to those um, single family parcels. I know that's not the table or part of the application, but right. do you have knowledge of them being under contract or have a sense of? what the proposed development timeline, because this ties back into the comment about the traffic. I right. The, um, they, are, they have been uh, marketing those parcels now for a while, and they are, there's no, they are not under contract at this point in time. There is no immediate development timeline okay. for those parcels. Um, um, just a question about the parking. I want to go back to that because some of the numbers and the statistics that you showed, there were averages. You know, it seemed to be a little bit misleading. I say that because uh, some of the averages that you said, you, you pictured large cities which have a lot of mass transit. And in this particular location, being fur further out east, I don't know what kind of transit uh, you have out there except for maybe a bus. And being close to the freeway, you're going to incur driving. And uh, now you're trying to, you know, reduce the amount of vehicles or parking. And I, I kind of foresee a, a possible problem with that in the future. How do you feel about that? Well, I think I'll, I'll make a couple comments on that. Um, you know, the first being that um, when you look at particularly the national averages, I mean, that includes That's cities of all. Mean. I think it's misleading. You well, need something well, more you, specific. If you, if you, if, even if you don't look at the national average of the 1.62, I think is what that number was, but that the, the bar graph. Um, and I don't want to get too hung up on, on national statistics, but that graph, that bar graph shows, um, you know, the number of parking spaces required in various communities across the country for, you know, one, two and three bedroom units. And it, so that, and that those, 
I know that's really hard to read. I mean, the cities that are listed along there, I mean, they range from urban cities, as you have discussed, which actually are the ones that fall more on the left end of the scale, which is an average parking ratio of one parking space per um, unit to, you know, there are cities like Colorado Springs on there. I mean, there are, it's, it's a good mix of different types of jur jurisdictions. And so I think the point really goes back to um, not so much how we compare to the national averages, but, you know, are we providing enough parking for this project at this location? That's my point, too. Right. And, and that's, and, and that's a, I mean, so that's a valid question. And so if you look at, um, as I said earlier, you can slice and dice these numbers a number of different ways. But we have um, 131 one-bedroom units, 181 two-bedroom units. So 95% of the units in this project are one and two bedrooms. We expect the majority of those units to have single occupancy. Um, because again of demographic trends, I mean, when you have the one-bedroom unit, we you can't assume that you've got you know two people living in a one-bedroom unit. You have two-bedroom units. You have residents that um, you know tip. I mean, and, and this is from, and I'll let uh, I'll let Jose Romero from Housing Trust Group speak to this as well, if he'd like to make a few comments about their historical experience. But you know, trends are that people will rent a, a two-bedroom unit and they'll use one for an office. But, but, and again, but, I, but well, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it, but we're talking about something pretty far east with not a whole lot of right. where it's going to encourage driving. So, now, if you're a closer inch, you know, it might work. I'm a little bit concerned about that, but uh, that's, so, that's why I'm wondering. So setting that aside, we have a total, if you look at our unit mix of one, two, and three-bedroom units, we have a total of 533 bedrooms in the, in, in the, over the over the scope of the project. And with our proposed minimum parking ratio, we have the ability to provide a parking space for every bedroom in that project and have an additional 52, I think, parking spaces to accommodate guest parking. So, so if you think about that, if you had, you know, you had one, if you had in, in the parking lot, one car, for you know, parked for every bedroom at any given point in time, we would still have an excess of parking spaces left over, which is this fifty, you know, fifty-two guest spaces. You, I mean, from a practical standpoint, with people's lives and travel schedules and the way people are in and out, that you know, that you don't you don't design a parking lot for the day after Thanksgiving is sort of what I you know how I like to look at things. I mean, you don't design a parking lot for the worst case scenario. We believe that this is a very comfortable standard that will accommodate residents that are single occupants that have more than two cars per per units. I mean, and when you look at it in an average basis, we think this is an acceptable ratio. I, I guess my my opinion is um, I. I don't necessarily agree with that. I guess I, I, I don't like to see a sea of asphalt, and you're right, if it was more of an urban-type development, then we could have a reduction in parking. Um, I guess I wanted to ask the question of how, uh, is there some way we can meet in the middle? I mean, we're 30 spaces apart, right? And so is there some way we can meet in the middle that, that would be accommodating to both, um, you know, the intent of the code as well as, as giving you guys some little bit of leeway? Just I mean, I think question. that there, you know, that I, that I think that there is probably a way to do that. We have looked at. Um, I mean, I'll go back to we're we're very comfortable with the 1.8 parking parking spaces per unit. I think you could look at an alternative tiered system potentially, where you assign a different parking ratio for each type of unit, um, and you may end up with something between 1.8 and 1.9. We probably can scrape together a few additional parking spaces. We just, we really don't believe that it's not necessary. Um, and I, you know, and so I'm very, you know, interested in, um, you know, your view of that, because again, we are 30 parking spaces a apart, and so it, it doesn't seem like that threshold is going to send us over the edge, but... Well, I, think and I, I guess, if, if I could continue, just what I, I really appreciate is the amenities and the open space and the quality of project that you're building, so I don't want to really take away from that, but we're so close in this that I just seem there's some way we can meet in the middle, that 30 spaces, you know, if, you, if we could find 15 spaces or something like that, that seems a little bit, um, you know, there might be a possibility there. 
I also had a question for staff. Staff, were you okay with the language provided on the um, emergency access? Uh, Chair, board members, uh, so you're focusing on the, the last item here with uh, could be provided to the plat and through that north, yeah. north section. Uh, that's certainly a, a, an option that uh, when we discussed this before, uh, the applicant hadn't developed, you know, that particular option. I'm going back when this was approved last time in, in 2014. And we've only just been discussing how this might, might work now. You know, we are very concerned about providing emergency access to that piece. If something happens to Hollis Road, uh, you're not getting back there. Uh, and this uh, is, a, is a good alternative, I think. Uh, we've really focused on trying to provide uh, you know, three ways to get back there. And that's why we've, we've continued to push for uh, the access between these multifamily units. We think if one's put in, it'll be pretty easy to tell the developer on that next piece, you've got to provide a connection there. They've got a, a big piece and adjusting things around to provide for you know, that point of access. Again, it doesn't seem like it'd be that difficult and can be pretty important long-term. But um, you know, if you're comfortable with this, it's certainly a condition that would work the way they have it written. So this language you could work with as we, a modified we, we, condition? We could work with it if you think the two points are, are sufficient. Okay, and then what about your feelings about the 1.85 as a compromise? You know, I feel like uh, uh, Board Member Aikida was sitting uh, pretty close to staff's concern and Board Member Allen also. Uh, we've certainly gone down to those types of, of levels in other parts of the city where we're closer in and amenities, uh, services, uh, transit has been closer by. There just really isn't much out here. And uh, certainly understand what the applicant is saying. Uh, also, in, in terms of, the, we understand demographic changes uh, are going on, but you know, we haven't really necessarily uh, seen it specifically here. And you know, given this location, we're just concerned that it won't be enough. It'll, it'll be a negative to the, to the complex uh, long term. One of our typical concerns with, with lack of parking on site is that means it's going to spill over into the adjacent neighborhood. Well, that's certainly not going to happen short term because it's not an adjacent neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And even the long term, it's probably not as big a problem. Uh, I'm not sure how Hawes Road is ultimately going to be developed and if parking will be allowed on Hawes Road. But any of the neighbors, uh, you know, come, neighbors that will come off that are getting kind of far away. And so I think people would park there very much. So that, that is as big a concern as it might be other places. But just having sufficient parking so that it will be a sustainable development long term. Still a concern, does, does 15 more spaces make that difference? It, it's hard to say really where where that happens. Um, but know, 15 more, is. less spaces might t not take away so much of the amenities too. That's right. So it, it's, it helps, if, again, if that's where the board feels comfortable, uh, so then we can work with the applicant to try to make that happen. I do want to go ahead, since I've got the floor, uh, and, and discuss the other, the other proposed change in here, and that was to, um, under, I guess, three, Romanet three. three, the one about the combination of at least three vehicular and pedestrian mm -hmm. spaces. It's on page three, three on three, three eyes. Yeah, Romanet three, about provide a co combination of at least three vehicular and pedestrian connections between the developments. Mm -hmm. That is a, a significant shift, potentially, from what was envisioned. Um, back with the previous zoning cases that we looked at on this property, we've been concerned about the isolation of the track in the northeast corner, and it developing and being its own kind of enclave without really creating an overall neighborhood. And so that's why we're looking for uh, th those three connections. Uh, we might end up with one vehicular or two pedestrian. It won't provide that same level of connectivity that we were after before, the way this wording has been changed. And so I just want to point that out. Okay, that was not a change th that you envisioned to include in this. No. Okay. Can, can I clarify that with John? Because I think maybe either, we, may be mis we may be reading that stipulation, the original stipulation, different sure. differently. Um, John, do you did you read the original stipulation that you envisioned a comp, the three vehicular and three pedestrian connections? I mean, I, I guess because from a practical standpoint, you know, Hawes Road is really going to be the the connection point for that northeastern parcel, which will be a public road, and so there's really we won't be providing any connections to them per se. I mean, they'll be having access to a public road, and so I'm I've I've struggled with how this gets in, interpreted and and i don't think this is a this is a huge issue for us but i was we did have some confusion as we went through our process as to interpreting that stipulation and so uh, board members uh, you know because we will likely be back again or could be back again to discuss this as, as actual development occurs that we could you know put off discussing this now because it's not connected with a, with a direct case but Hawes road could end 
just barely north into that those, those parcels. Sure. We don't know how far north it will go. And so again, we end up with the two parcels with no real connection going on between them. And so as an idea, we do want to make sure there is connection and creating a larger neighborhood and not isolated tracks. And I'm concerned about reducing those number of connections the way this is worded. We're happy to defer the discussion on so, that one. So can the project, I, I haven't looked that closely, so the design, can that be adapted to provide the three points it, of it, connection? It, it, Chair Board without Member, a, without a major. this particular project does not affect that connectivity. Okay. It's really kind of a separate issue. Uh, okay. talking about. While I am speaking, I did want to make a comment. I am very familiar with apartment projects. I do a lot of work on them. And what you're proposing is really more typical than what you would suggest it is with predominantly two bedrooms, a lot of one bedrooms, and very few three. That's just where the market's at. Sure. And I agree with the other two comments. You know, if you were in an infill around along a rail line, that would be one thing. But close to that 2.0 is really a good number. So I'm pretty much, I'm very much in support of, you know, where the staff members are going. I don't know if 15 or 18 additional spaces is the right answer, but I, yeah, well, I think, it seems like I think it's going to be more time. and more less parking. Like the Blanford Garage is 19.4, you know. <laughs> Well, it got through, but I mean, uh, but if it's a good thing. project and it's fully it's a beautiful if it's not project. well, if if it is and it stays fully occupied, you're gonna. Have, I see a parking problem. If it languishes like some of the others and you don't quite get there or whatever, you know, it might get by. But still, parking I think is important. So I just wanted to throw my thoughts in on that. Yeah, make a I too. also weigh in more on the 1.9, but I would certainly consider a compromise of 1.85 and also the emergency connection change yeah could I um, this is Jose this is Jose, Jose Romero from housing trust group I think he wanted to make a couple comments if you would sure so thank you a um, couple comments regarding the different parking ratios uh, we develop all up and down Florida we develop into Tennessee and this will be our first project in Arizona uh, up and down Florida 1.6 is generally the number that we see across all sorts of communities. Um, Miami is very wide and spread, and I work on a lot of projects that are not accessible by any type of um, a rail or even busway access. So in those communities, we still see the same 1.3 you guys are seeing on your rental side. So owner-occupied uh, housing units, whether it be townhouses or houses, generally have closer to the 2.0 that everybody thinks about, which is that 1.8 uh, that she discussed. If Mesa's average household only has 1.6, as you draw, right, from those households, initially, if you only have like a 10-unit project, maybe a 30-unit project, that 2.0 or 2.1 makes a lot of sense because you might draw some community or some households that have 2.0 or maybe even more. If you're drawing from 325 families, you get much, much closer to that average. So when you're looking at that, uh, especially as far as visitors go, as far as travel goes, on average you end up with less um, used parking spaces than you actually have units or bedrooms. So the, the 1.8 we think is well, well over served, um, and we don't see it as an issue. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, board members? The microphone sorry about that. Uh, so I would like to talk about parking uh, a big part of what I do for a living is look at multifamily developments across the United States and not just in big cities but mid-sized cities and small towns and uh, I agree with your analysis I see more typical you know one space per one bed one and a half to two spaces for two bed and it kind of goes from there there are a few cities where it is just that single ratio and it makes my life easier because there's less calculations to make but I mean you've got enough beds or enough spaces for all the bedrooms um, I think that's a key point um, I don't think that there's going to be a problem with parking I, I would be in support of the 1.8 actually um, I would not like to see a reduction of any of those amenities I do I don't yeah I don't I'd rather keep the 1.8. I, I support that. If the board wants to compromise and the applicant wants to compromise, yeah. I would like to 
to be part of that, but I don't think it's necessary to. Even in this location, I mean, right? Because just from again from my experience, I've seen these projects in very urban areas, very small towns. I mean, I understand everybody's concern, and I don't think it's as far out and as far away as we think. And I think these trends that they're talking about are are true. And I think maybe we could look at. Boy, she's maybe, on your side, so. <laughs> it just so happens that I do look at this sort of thing a lot, but I think yeah. maybe the city, we, we could look at maybe changing our parking requirements to see if it's something that w would work for our community to be a little bit more in line with the trends and with the rest of, I wouldn't say the rest of the communities out there, but with a lot of them. Any other yeah. comments or discussion board? I think we have one more. One more. One more um, regarding the number of spaces. Um, I think we can have another four or five spaces because we've really maxed out this this uh, this site plan, and any increase above that four or five really starts to cut into that dog park and playground that we've added. Um, and we believe that it's a really great amenity for our residents and uh, a use of that asphalt. Um, so we understand that we're asking for a reduction, but I can tell you that from a management standpoint, we don't we don't see um, more than 1.5 1.6 actually being uh, used and I'd be happy to provide more information along those lines of uh, the developments that we provided Gilbert properties others that have um, you know their current parking ratios and what's there overnight because overnight is the main uh, highest use of those uh, units and again the higher unit count you have the less and less you see all those parking because more people are traveling. You're, it's more likely that you have residents that aren't aren't at your project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're at a point where I think we need a motion. Okay, <clears throat> I'll give a stab at this one then. Um, thank you. So I would recommend that we approve. Um, I remember here. Um, 1604. 1604. Um, with the following conditions. Uh, one, uh, with the, with the, um, with the conditions as, as staff has written, with the exception of um, rewording the condition on the uh, emergency access to match what was uh, submitted by the applicant. So then that I would be six I will be replaced with the I can read that, read that in if I need to. Um, and that is replaced uh, by um, to show the uh, to the exception property to the north northeast corner will be provided by a driveway and emergency access gate accessible between the single family parcel to the west and the adjacent Casa Mia subdivision. Such emergency access will be approved with a preliminary plat for the single family parcels. Um, and then the second modification would be, uh, I don't believe, I, don't, I think that we were okay with the three access points. Uh, so that was the other one. Um, and then my, uh, the third modification would be, um, well, I guess it wouldn't be a modification. It would be to only require a 1.8 uh, parking space per, um, at the ratio per unit. Um, I would recommend that we, ap we approve this case with those following conditions. Okay, did you also include you, you included this one here because I wasn't know if did, were, we were comfortable with that one. That one, the combination we did, they were comfortable with that combination, right? Correct. The combination of vehicle. I thought that we were taking that out. We were not going to include that. Page two provide a combination of at least three vehicle and pedestrian connections between the overall baseline mixed use PAD site and the exception probably located at the northeast corner. I think we agreed that we're going to leave it as the current stip right. is. Exactly. Okay, so, so that, remove that, that from the motion. Well, I did. No, I just yeah, left it okay. as it is. I just didn't mention Okay, good. So we just have the two right. items. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any discussion regarding that motion board? Do I have a second? 
right? I'll go ahead and second it. Okay. Now I, I should second. ask yeah. if there's any discussion, but no one wanted to before, so let's vote. It passed six to one with Mr. Clements voting nay. Okay, is there any other matters? Is there any other matters? Staff want to just go over on that? No. Okay, I think that's all we have on the agenda today. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion that we adjourn. The second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 No nays. Thank you, board. Thank you.